I'm going to share this. This is just basically a, <clears throat> a little body of my work. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of run through it. It's got a bunch of process stuff in it. Uh, I know that there were some specific questions uh, that I'm looking forward to answering with people, um, but also we can kind of let this be a little bit more freeform. And, and um, if I skip past anything in the, the document that people want to kind of talk about, um, give a shout out and I'll, I'll discuss how I approached a thing. Um, but uh, first I'll uh, introduce myself for people that aren't super familiar with me or my work. Um, my name is Lake Horwitz. I am a concept artist and illustrator. I am currently the principal visual development artist over at Wizards of the Coast. Uh, I tackle most of the things that don't have anything to do with their games. Uh, so it's all the concept art and visual development that spins around the IP rather than the actual game expression. Um, it's pretty big picture stuff. Uh, so I don't do a lot of like the world building or um, uh, specific little nitty gritty deta details on things, uh, but I am examining like larger directions of where we're going with a lot of the properties that we're working on. Um, so I have been working as a freelancer and illustrator for about 10 years now, maybe a little bit more. Um, these are some of the bigger names that I've worked with. Um, I spent a bunch of time working with Volta and One Pixel Brush as outsourcing studios, uh, where I got to work on a bunch of pretty high profile projects. Um, one of the biggest benefits of working with places like that is that the, the sheer variety of the stuff that you work on and the number of shipped titles in your body of work grows really rapidly. Um, I spent a year at Monolith working on Shadow of War, and I spent a year at, uh, two years at Gree working on a variety of mobile games early on in my career. Uh, and that's actually how I met Josh too. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, if people weren't aware, Wizards is a subsidiary of Hasbro, but I have also done some work for Hasbro directly doing pitch work and storyboards for some of their advertising department. Uh, probably most of that will never be seen. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna run through um, some of the academic and um, academic work that I did in school. Uh, this is fairly older stuff, but it's highly technical. People who've gone through Atelier programs will recognize some of the exercises. Uh, these were, I wanna say 60 hour figure drawings. Um, they typically would take about three days to do a, a highly accurate block in, then um, a day or two on poster and value studies uh, and color studies, and then about three weeks of drawing and drawing and or painting for the final. And this one I believe is like 20 by 30, maybe a bit bigger, I don't remember exactly. But this kind of like technical study is something that I've really tried to carry forward. Um, through everything that I've been doing since. And the philosophy that goes into these um, is something that I see a lot of people kind of working with uh, in, in their artwork, especially in the digital illustration and digital concept art industries. They, they're trying to execute like purists. There's sort of a, a value that people put on being able to do something just like with a flat round brush and flat paint. Um, and then, Conversely, there's a subset of people that value only high render photo bashing and like um, hyper realism and or elevated realism. Uh, and I actually see that as kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, you're, when you're talking about working as a purist, uh, you're talking about using pure technical ability. Um, the the most broadly applicable skill set that can translate to the most tools. Um, but then uh, that kind of falls apart a little bit when you're working in production art because that kind of work uh, can be a little too fast for working like a purist. Uh, even if you can do this kind of execution at a high level pretty quickly, um, the way that you need to pivot sometimes necessitates changes that work against the medium that you're working in. Um, and the way that I, I like to think about it is it's very useful to learn like a purist. And that's why I would highly recommend the 
kind of academic study here, because all of this informs all of the choices that I'm going to be making throughout all of my work. Um, the skills developed don't go away when you're starting to work in photo bashing, 3D, or, or other digital tools. Uh, but when you go into, say, concept art, you want to start executing like a cheater. Uh, this is how I approach it. Um, I take the shortest route to the destination as I possibly can. Um, and that tends to also work out in illustration because really the end product, the final piece, um, most of the time when I'm working with people, they don't really care how I got there. Uh, only the end result matters when I'm doing the work for a purpose. So I kind of have that kind of duality in mind all the time. I'm learning like a purist and executing like a cheater. So this was done for Shadow of War. Um, one of the concepts for the expansion, they had like same words or something in it. What's like, what's some of the technique you use on this one? Uh, yeah, good question. So there's a little bit of photo texture here just to get some light areas. This was largely built in ZBrush, uh, but then I brought it back into Photoshop and did a lot of painting uh, over the top of it. So partially it was because I didn't want to have to map out or think about uh, a five point radially symmetrical mouth. <laughs> and <laughs> so I modeled yeah. each of these kind of individual individual things and uh, the general shape of a shell and then put it back around in perspective that way and the tail as well. Because <clears throat> just having things overlap in the right way as they, they go around, um, it's sort of like trying to use 3D to work out ellipses because ellipses are nightmares to, to draw. So yeah, this was mostly just ZBrush though. And even this texture here, I think was a ZBrush brush. Nice. But I, I didn't color or texture it in, in ZBrush eventually. Like all of this is just brush strokes down here. So it, it really is a combination. Uh, the, the way I like to think about it is like, yeah, I could probably have done this in ZBrush eventually, but I can do it faster in Photoshop and it doesn't matter that much. This is uh, also for Shadow of War. I did a bunch of the um, orc tribes and outfits for their nemesis system. Um, there were sets of limitations for this, like all of the joints had to be able to separate so that you could dismember them and stuff. Um, but all right, this is the final product of how it came out. And you can see some pretty heavy photo work in here. I did not build the orc model. I was working on top of that. But uh, this is kind of the early sketches there of me just finding the shape language of the things that I wanted to do. Um, I had a set of buildings from this tribe that I was working off of to get the aesthetic. It was like a bunch of slabs of rusted metal on top of each other. So th that's kind of where these shapes started to come from. And I actually did a lot of these, uh, more, than, more than I usually would, because um, I was left to my own devices for, for some time. My art director uh, wasn't checking in that often, and so I just kept doing them. Um, I think the one that ended up moving forward was basically this one into that. So you can see that I, I basically painted the whole thing. Uh, and then because this was being sent to a Chinese outsourcing team um, and they didn't speak very good English, we had to kind of hit them over the head with, um, with the, the materials and the shapes and stuff. So I ended up building all of the armor in ZBrush because I, I did have access to the model of the, the work. Um, but yeah, I, I built it in ZBrush. I even built the face in ZBrush. Um, and then textured in Modo, I think, uh, and then worked on top of it with a bunch of photo textures and uh, Photoshop brushes just to get to here. Um, there's sort of a, I, I've noticed just this, I brought it up already, I've noticed this conflict that's come up in a lot of the concept art world. Um, B between that kind of purist viewpoint and the cheatery, you know, production art viewpoint. And the way that I see it is that the, the changing landscape of technology, as well as the trends in the industry, because they are trends, it's like the reason that all of ArtStation looks very similar to people is because that all of that kind of stuff is popular. Um, it's sort of the pop music equivalent of art and everybody's trying to make it. Um, yeah, the styles that become popular or lose popularity, all of those things make a flexible process very powerful and almost necessary. Um, I try actually not to keep to a consistent methodology where each of the pieces is approached in the same way because uh, it's sort of like having a comfort zone for how you work. It's, it's a consistent methodology is 
is basically the same thing that you've been learning to avoid in order to become a skilled draftsperson and painter. And in the same vein, I, I feel like I need to avoid getting locked into repetitive patterns of how I make things. Um, each piece and project has its own needs and I believe should be addressed individually as much as possible. So I use sets of philosophies and principles rather than following specific steps. It, it kind of shows like when you do that, you can basically work on any genre or any uh, style as long as you have that foundation. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I, I think, Josh, you have a bunch of this ability as well. Uh, and I do see it in some others um, that like one of the biggest and most useful skills that you have is the ability to learn new skills and new styles quickly. It's like you can give me about, you know, two to three weeks and I can make work that passively resembles a, a specific thing at this point. Um, I'm familiar enough with digital tools and painting techniques that like, I don't know, slap something in front of me and I can at least approximate looking like it very quickly. Um, and that's because I've I've studied how to kind of reverse engineer techniques and adopt them into my working methods. <clears throat> what principles do you use? Yeah, so the, I mean, there's a lot of them, but um, if, if people are familiar with uh, combat systems like um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or Muay Thai or Krav Maga, um, they, they actually follow similar sets of principles uh, in terms of how they make their methodologies. Um, all of the Kind of takeaways that I try to keep in mind when I'm working on things. I try to keep them simple and small. I try to keep them efficient, easy to learn, easy to remember, and easy to implement. Um, because when I'm working on a piece, I have so many different things in mind that are specific to that piece that my guiding principles have to be very, very simple so that they can be applied at every step. Um, so for some of those, uh, let's see. One thing I would say is uh, an overarching principle that I use for almost everything is that I'm always searching for the method of depicting the final more than I am than, than I am actually trying to depict the final thing. Um, I have an idea in my head and I'm looking for how to do that best rather than trying to do the thing itself because it lets me be very free and destructive with my own work as I'm moving forward. Um, it means that I don't lament pivoting if I realize that an avenue that I've been going down has been ultimately fruitless. Uh, and I'm trying to always kind of self-critique and assess objectively the things that I'm working on. Um, and basically continually asking myself, is this working for this piece? And if it's not, I'll discard it as quickly as I possibly can, um, because I'm looking for the thing that is working. Uh, I stress test kind of the methods in other spaces. And, and that comes back around to like the personal work and personal improvement. Um, that's like the proving ground for learning which techniques will work for what things. And there, I give myself more freedom to uh, fully explore the extent of how a thing would work. And then later, I will know whether or not it's useful for the given assignment. Hold on, there's a siren outside. I don't know if you guys can hear that. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Are these uh, 3D uh, done yeah. in uh, Pulsar and stuff? Or? Yeah, so this is done in Daz. Oh, Daz. Um, there was a need for this kind of like Space Marine type character. And um, the first thing that I was just doing was seeing if there was a base that I could find in Daz that felt right from the get go. because. Part of the process of 3D and photo bashing um, that I took away from, um, oh, I want to say it was Jama Jurabayev and Shadi Safadi. Uh, through working with Shadi, uh, we came to use a set of principles that were like, if you're using 3D and photos and you want your final to look photo real or um, as realistic as possible, what you need to do is have that part of the process do as much work as you possibly can. Um, without overloading that, the, the time spend. And so if I, I, I wanna get as close as I can to the final with just 3D. Uh, so if the first thing I'm doing is just looking for the shape and the pose of the thing. Uh, I found that not too far in, I wanna say. These were just different musculatures because I was uh, sharing those. 
These are three different configurations built out of, um, I think I had like three or four different kit bash sets that I was using for this. Um, we bought some existing film models and some of this is constructed out of parts of RoboCop. Some of it's constructed out of parts of Iron Man. Some of these are ZBrush parts I did myself and some of these are ZBrush parts that we got from the client. And then I think I built the guns myself but I can't remember super clearly. I'll have a page of them later. Quick texture pass in just for colors in Moto. Trying out different hairstyles and whatever. Yeah, and so this is like all of the different patterns of like lighting and like little things that could be placed here and there. And you can see how quickly you can iterate in 3D when that's kind of the end process that you're going for. But you do get locked into the general shape of things very quickly. So it's like iterating on the shoulder shape, easy. Iterating on like where the breakup of all of the leg panels are, a little bit harder. So yeah, this is where I kind of ended up. And I'm looking at um, these little bits here that are not super clean. And I know because I have spent that time in the academic side of things that I can fix those myself in Photoshop. I know how to paint well enough that I can just clean that up whenever I want. And same thing with like these rough edges here. Um, like that's not gonna be that rough in the final. I'm just gonna clean it up later. Easier to do it in Photoshop than in 3D for me, but that's not always gonna be true for everybody. So then yeah, uh, sample color passes and lighting ideas. Uh, the other kind of thing that I'm always evaluating is how precise do I need to be with the final piece? Um, and that typically depends on who's going to see it and why. Uh, if this is going to be pitch material for, um, for executives or whatever, it needs to be pretty precise. They have a very difficult time interpreting kind of more artsy mark making type stuff. Um, so that that means that like the end result might be less beautiful, but it will be very, very precise and clear. Um, whereas with illustration work, I can be accurate and, and um, imply a lot more stuff, uh, but like not all aspects of the design need to be visible. Not every aspect of the storytelling has to be like bonk you over the head clear. Uh, the way that I see the difference between concept art and illustration is that they're both, the steps for concept art and the steps for illustration are both meant to reduce the cost, the time cost of various changes that need to be made as people kind of change their minds or realize new things or um, new considerations have to be taken into account. But in concept art, the aim really is to reduce the cost of changes at each stage. The cost to change a final should not be that much higher than changing something at sketch. Whereas in illustration, uh, a lot of the time, what ends up happening is the final piece has a lot of these more artistic elements present in it. Um, and so you reduce the cost of changes during the process, but don't do that so much at the final in favor of an aesthetic. So like, it's not ultra necessary that all concept art for a particular project needs to look the same, but it is kind of necessary for illustrations to have a consistent visual identity. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, if you do a character design, usually if that gets built in 3D rigged and like all the VFX and animation gets put in, that takes like months sometimes. Whereas right. like, if you want to go back and change that character, you got to start over basically. Yeah. Yeah, so these were done for concept pushers over at Wizards. And, and this is another example of like stuff that's pretty all over the place in terms of how I'm doing it. Like I think I built this in ZBrush. Uh, there may have been a Daz figurine as the base. I have a fire brush that makes fire and sparks. Um, and then everything else of this figure was painted, like the costuming, the patterning, all that stuff, um, which would have actually been really difficult to do in 3D, like the cloth falling there difficult to do in, in 3D quickly. I mean, like you can have things like Marvelous Designer or um, uh, Daz has its own cloth sim now, but it, because of what this is, it's just easier to paint it. It's gonna take me like three minutes to paint it where it might take me, I don't know, an hour to build the, the clothing appropriately and then rig it. And then depending on the computing power, take another hour to accurately simulate everything and pose it correctly. So it's just not worth it for something like this. 
I think these were all just straight up painted. And then these were definitely just me messing around in Photoshop. Um, so it, I really do try to always ask myself, like, what is the right tool for this job? Uh, here's another principle that I, I live by for all of my work. Um, I have a, uh, it, it kind of ties into the other parts of it, but this is the bite-sized takeaway. Um, I'm always ready to change my plan. I'm always looking for whether or not I should be changing my plan. Um, so always be ready to change your plan, but you have to have a plan to change a plan. So the first thing that I do is I kind of plot out a route that I'll be taking. And then the second thing that I do throughout the entire process is continually ask myself, is this the same route I should be on? And then if it's not, immediately change. I believe all of these are straight up painted as well. This is all just Photoshop. And this comes down to like even whether or not I'm working traditionally. Sometimes um, it is easier to get my ideas down on a, a page with pencil or ink, uh, depending on what the subject matter is. But if it's a human with normal human proportions, starting with Daz is usually the way to go for production art at least. Less so for illustration because of its very specific failings. And then the other thing that I, I always try to keep in mind is that like thumbnails and sketches and studies and finals, um, it, it, we, we talk about them a lot in terms of like what the purpose of one is versus others and how one should look compared to others. But really, th those are all soft boundaries. Um, a lot of people talk about them as like separate parts of the process, but a thumbnail is not that far away from a sketch and a sketch isn't that far away from a final. And there are some people that basically do finals at thumbnail stage. Um, and so it all really does come down to the project there. This is a fun little thing that I got to do for stylized gods and goddesses that never got made. Oh uh, yeah, here's some illustration work. So this is largely built in ZBrush um, with a little, uh, well, no, wait, this is a combination of Moto, ZBrush, and Daz to get the figurines. And then actually, you know what? Now that I'm remembering it, I did use Marvelous to get the, the fabric sim for these. Um, but then all of the fire, all of the sparks, most of the texture actually was uh, Photoshop and painting. I, I would say that um, I, ha I have a very deep understanding of Photoshop at this point, uh, and that, that helps me kind of with that approach. But there are only a small handful of tools I use for the most part. And there's a, there are a few things that I, I wouldn't be able to leave behind that no other um, program is replicating yet. Like uh, the mixer brush is, is heavily part of my process now, as well as the, um, the camera raw filter. Also, I remember somebody was asking a set of specific questions in the email chain, Josh. Um, did you get those? For Michelle, is that the one you're talking about? Yes, that's it. Yeah. So, I mean, I can pepper those questions throughout your talk if you want. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So, I, I'll just do one. Uh, what kind of things do you do for a faster workflow? Oh, yeah. I, I guess I've already started to talk about that a little bit. Um, so, the first thing, and this is um, a principle that I like to call destructive editing, uh, which is basically getting something uh, that's kind of along the line to finished down really quickly, even if it looks just awful. Um, it's like getting deep into the accurate but ugly phase really quickly, um, and then deliberately kind of destroying it uh, in a way that that is um, uh, you can't undo. So like clearing out the history and stuff like that, um, and that keeps my mindset kind of free to experiment quickly. Oh, I think I included some process structure here. Uh, so like this was for a magic card. And this is how I start <laughs> with these scribbly ass doodles. Um, this is typically how I'll start almost everything. Uh, and this is not me trying to make a thing look like a thing. This is 
stuff that I visualize in my head that I need to take down as notes so that when I have a set of them, I can compare them and see what space I've already been in and see what space I need to go to. Like, and to my mind, these should not be beautiful. They should, the only job that they need to do is remind me of the thing that I was visualizing. Uh, if they're doing more than that, it, it can actually be kind of detrimental. Uh, and then you can see I fully slapped together a set of stuff in Daz, and uh, I forget where the backgrounds came from. I forget where I forget where a lot of this came from, honestly. But uh, the T Rex and the figure, and I believe the clothing of the figure came from Daz. Uh, so then I take these and basically use them like uh, like my cats, um, and that's how I've lit them so that I can do these pencil sketches off of them. And this is where I do all of the work of figuring out the methods of depiction that I was talking about before. Um, and that, that kind of searching for a method that I was describing is actually a way of speeding up my process. Um, it keeps me from thinking too much about having to turn the dial all the way up on a very specific method. Um, it gets me to the point where I can say, okay, the method has been found. And by that point, it's usually at the point where somebody would call it done. Uh, so here I'm looking for specific visual heuristics for how to depict things. Uh, so then this is scanning that drawing back in. Uh, I did a quick specularity pass in Daz to get the, the head of the T-Rex highlights in the right spot. Um, I believe, I don't remember how I got the feathers. I want to say these are bashed together from like a, parrot or something. You can see that I left like the drawn ones too. All I needed was, th this is where I would get into destructive editing from this point forward. I'm just getting to the point where I have enough information to get to final. Yeah, I think I'm starting to work on the background down here too a little bit. Like you can see the shapes starting to be designed. And then yeah, the difference between these frames really shows like what I do in Photoshop. And it, it's actually a fair amount. I think this is a texture of lizard skin, but like there's a bunch of mixer brush on top of it right now. So one of the other question was, what kind of things do you consider the work finished and polished? Is there like a mental checklist you go through? Like a texture? Right, I remember sliding? that question. So uh, yeah, not really. The A mental checklist for me is more comparing the picture to what I think the needs of the final product are going to be. Um, a lot of people will be like, remove all of your brush strokes by painting them out. Or, um, uh, or like getting rid of the pencil lines that are present underneath things or making sure that everything has accurate lighting or, or anything like that. And really, um, I guess the way that I would approach that differently would be to say, I want everything in the image to be deliberate rather than accidental. Uh, I don't leave a lot of room for happy accidents unless I deliberately say to myself, okay, this part is going to be chaotic on purpose and I'm going to find a beautifully chaotic piece. But even that decision is very deliberate. I'm looking for a specific feeling out of it um, and I want to know that I'm achieving that. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that there's like, yeah, do the mixer brush pass. Yeah, do the camera raw filter pass. But I use those things a lot uh, and at every step of the piece. Um, like you can see in the rendering here, like I just didn't want this to look photo-y. That wasn't, that's not something I'm interested in. That's not something that the piece would be helped by. Um, and so, and, and the way that it currently appears is kind of accidental. So I bring it forward and make the shapes back here deliberate. Um, I'm not, I'm not relying on everything that was there, or if I was, I would be very deliberately relying on the things that are there. I just don't let things slip by me. This is sort of like a, a buck stops here philosophy, where um, I, I never say to myself, oh, nobody will notice that. I, I'm looking through the piece and saying, okay, what would call people's attention away from the stuff that I want their attention on? And that's usually the stuff that I work on. Like right in here, this little passage of pencil marks was getting to me. And so I didn't need it to be more 
finished looking necessarily, but I didn't want it to be kind of so scratchy there. And then the shape design of the cloak was feeling very accidental as well. And so I wanted that to be a little bit more deliberate. And then there's a materials read pass that's usually pretty good to do, um, but you can achieve that in whatever way you want. So I wouldn't say that there's a specific checkbox to make for that. There, there are kind of hierarchical needs too. Um, as humans, uh, using contrast as our metric, the first thing that's usually important is the shape of stuff in the composition or in the character design or the, the, the design that's part of the concept art. Um, and then after shape, um, you basically get to, uh, to value and then temperature and then color. And um, the accuracy of the lighting is actually much lower on the list of all those things. It's, um, it's definitely more accurate than the color, but it's way less accurate than the overall shape read. I, I have a question. Uh, yeah. When you plan your illustration, do you have like a, a final version in your mind or how much do you explore and change through the process? So this illustration that I have right here um, pretty much is already here. You can, you can kind of see it present in that first little doodle. Um, the only thing that I have worked out in my head at this point is uh, we have the vampire raising a staff up high and the T-Rex bowing its head low and the vampire is on the left and the T-Rex is on the right. And then as I'm kind of building it out, um, plotting out like, okay, how bright should the sunlight be to kind of show that it's under the glare of, uh, you know, something harsh or... Um, as I said before, what I'm looking for is like the methods of depiction. So I'm trying to depict a T-Rex being kind of brought low and, and um, subjugated more or less by this character. And so when I am making a decision, I think, okay, which of, what way can I make this decision that will bolster that kind of priority that I've set for myself? Um, and that means that I don't actually have to have the full illustration in mind this long ago, but I'm probably going to have it in mind pretty quickly after uh, this one. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So here's another example of one that I have a bunch of process shots for. Um, this is for D and D. Uh, so yeah, again, starting with these like really scratchy, sketchy doodles. Uh, I think these were Procreate. Um, and you can see that I basically have the whole illustration in mind already down here. How much, uh, how much time do you spend at, on this stage? I try not to spend more than two minutes on any one of these. Okay. Um, I'll typically do between eight and 16. Um, sometimes it requires a lot more, sometimes it requires a lot less. And sometimes I won't do them. Um, some, sometimes it's best to just jump in, but I think over time I've been doing them more and more because, uh, and, and I think the reason for that is that I have more ideas um, than I used to when I was younger. Um, is, is this something that you would show like the art directors or the- No, or the, not at all. Okay, all right. No, uh, I would show an art director that can paint, but an art director that is just an art director, I wouldn't show them. I see. Um, because anybody who sees this that doesn't know how to interpret them they're going to send you down some ridiculous pathways. <laughs> yeah, so this is taking a few of them forward. Um, then working up the thumbnail. So this is what, how I was describing before, like the boundary between thumbnail and sketch is kind of soft. Um, so I get to here. And so this, this is what I submitted. Yeah, I, I've like never seen any of these this stuff. That's really cool to value study thing here. Thanks, and and this is actually a good example of um, uh, an illustration that I executed like a purist as well. Hmm. Like I don't think I had reference for these yet at this point. Um, 
and they asked for a four-armed person in the throne, which was which ended up being kind of a, a challenge. I had to like recompose the shape of it around everything that was happening. Hmm. Yeah, got to spend some time on this. Oh, I, I included these because this was the reference I had to go off of. And I was like, how do I make these look cool? Because <laughs> it's like this dude's weird little tiny nose and no jaw, and it's like this guy's just <laughs> intimidating Baron. And I'm like, like okay, a, how? Like a catfish, kind of. <laughs> yeah. Oh. How do you make that look cool and intimidating? So do you ever find your? Do you ever find yourself like noodling when you're trying to, if your ideas aren't fully fleshed out when you first start? I used to. Um, I I used to. So I think it's a nervous tick that people find um, because you learn how to depict lighting. Uh, pretty early on in your career if you're gonna have the skills. Like, honestly, good rendering is one of the easiest things to learn because <laughs> it does follow kind of a formula. Like, light acts in one way. Light is light. There's not really different kinds of light. There's sort of different colors that di affect different surfaces in different ways, but light works like light works. Um, and I think that younger artists, myself included, when I was earlier in my career, when you don't really know what you should be doing next, you start to render stuff because you're like, well, I need to be working on it. So I'm just gonna, you know, I know how to make this look beautiful because I know how to make the lighting look accurate. And so you render on it and render on it and render on it. And then you're like, oh shit, I should have made a different choice like four hours ago. And so I don't do that that much anymore um, if I can help it. Uh, although I, it does happen sometimes, especially in illustrations that I do for myself. Uh, you'll see later when I get into some of my personal work that um, there are a couple of pieces that I would actually do finished illustrations for and then be like, oh shit, I gotta go back and just redo the whole thing at this point. So yeah, these are more of the concept art for the things that I ended up doing. So this is the, the face that I ended up finding there. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. I. I did find reference of a, a fish head man that somebody else had 3D modeled that was not bad. I, this isn't exactly it, but I, um, it had kind of the regalness that I wanted out of it. Yeah. These are these are all for d and I really like working on D&D. They let me do a lot of stuff. Oops, scrolled a little fast there. This is a combination of a bunch of things. Uh, a bunch of, there's some Daz, there's some ZBrush, there's some Moto, uh, and a whole bunch of Photoshop. And then certain parts of these are painted that you wouldn't think are, and some certain parts are bashed that you similarly would think are something else. Um, like, I think the scales on these lizards are, so the lizards are the models I got from Daz. The horny bits are ZBrush. The scales on the back are Photoshop, but then a bunch of the other horny bits are actually just painted. And uh, like the saddle there, I don't actually remember if I painted that or bashed it or whatever. Um, this, this city back here, it looks like just silhouettes. Uh, I actually modeled most of this uh, and then went back in. This was like a, a bunch of stacked cubes and I just used it for the lighting to kind of paint in on top of it. And then I, I could be wrong but I'm pretty sure that these three figures of the Dark Elves are actually all just painted. I might have had some models in there just for staging purposes, but I'm not sure. Oh, this was a weird one. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is all just painted. Uh, this is entirely appropriate also with a little bit of color correction at the end. And combination of things. Uh, this is a bunch of moto for the environment. Um, there's a, a way to make 3D models look like they've been hand painted. Uh, ooh, this is not that big, but um, it essentially requires basically doing an underpainting and then painting the 3D model back in uh, into it to cl clean up edges in various places. Uh, what do you mean painting the 3D model back in? So like I would do um, another underpainting parts of this which basically look like um, what you see right here. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Yeah, I can. 
Yeah. So like oh, basically okay. right here, you can see what the underpainting might look like, or like um, like right here, um, mm. or in here, you can see like some sketchier marks, and and also here. But what that doesn't do is it doesn't give you this clean sharp edge down below. It doesn't give you this edge. It doesn't give you um, like like right here. Mm -hmm. And so what I'll do is I'll, I'll put the 3D model back on top of the piece and kind of brush it back in to clean up those edges that are looking a little janky. Okay. So it, it comes down to a decision-making process of uh, when you are oil painting, you leave parts of your underpainting to direct the viewer's attention either away from them or towards them in a stylized manner. And the philosophy for this is very similar. Like right here, didn't paint the 3D model back in because that part isn't part that I want you to be looking at. Hmm. But I do do it here because all of this is going to be super tight and it's going to draw your attention. Uh, ben Hill has a question. Uh, that one D and D piece with the gold armor. I remember that you started that one with a gouache painting. Is that I did. Name? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, I can probably pull that up. Let me see if I have it on. Have it ready. Like yeah, uh, yeah. I rarely hear people start with like gouache or oil paintings in like a video game industry. Mm. Well, part of that is because I am not confident at my ability to finish in gouache yet. And so I wanted to do gouache, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with my ability to sketch in it, just not get to get to final yet. Um, here, let's see. I, I do have it. Nope. Trying to remember which. There we go. Okay, so let me share these. So this is um, this is the gouache painting that was uh, the original. They wanted her arms up, and they needed the face to be more skeletal looking. Uh, and this is a gouache painting that I did for the same set. Um, yeah, I might have. Oh yeah, and so I did this because I was having trouble getting the lighting to cast correctly. There, so I, uh, I actually did this after I did the sketch um, because I needed the information. Yeah. Yeah, that's very cool. I actually like the gouache paintings a lot. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> they, yeah, look really nice. Yeah, they're just not suitable for for the final. Yeah. Uh, I actually did gouache sketches for this one too. Um, which are significantly more all over the place. Let's see if I have that. Because it's, oh, that's the wrong. I'm just gonna see if I can pull it open. Mm, I don't appear to have, oh wait, is this it? Yeah, here, this is, this is the painting that was uh, for that. So again, gouache. Um, there's a little bit of Photoshop to get like the glow to come out there, but that, I think that's about it. Um, maybe this is the Ross, no. And uh, so I would take this into Photoshop, uh, and I broke it apart into layers. So now I have, you know, the background, the sky there. Uh, I remember from a while ago, and I think I got this from Whit Brockna. Um, he said, and I, I took this to heart, that like the secret to a lot of good uh, digital painting is uh, good layer management. And just like keeping things separated in the right way. Uh, I don't think that I am the most skilled person at it. But I, at the very least, try to keep like the different stuff kind of laid out so that I can work on things above and below each other. Okay, let's see. More illustrations. And you can see like the difference in the approach here because there's, uh, I think this is just painted, and I did most of this with the pencil tool and the and gradient maps. Um, whereas this kind of started with some dads and some photo, 
uh, but is completely finished with the mixer brush. And it's just a, a change in like how I wanted to approach like blades of grass versus waves or the texture of, you know, wood versus like skin. Uh, do you have your favorite approach? Uh, that is constantly evolving. I, I do have one that I keep coming back to and I'll, it'll come up later when I get into my personal work. Uh, I do really like working off of the pencil tool though. Um, I, one thing that I know about myself is that if I allow myself to get fiddly, I will over render things and I'll, I'll just keep working on them uh, more and more and more. Um, and I tend to have more success in my work when I'm working with tools and media that are very brutal and uh, force very deliberate decision making. I think my best sketches that I do are actually in Sharpie, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, the pencil that I draw with is a 5.6 millimeter carpenter's pencil because mm -hmm. it's such a brutal tool. And that's one of the reasons I like gouache too is because it gets me very present in, in the making of the thing. Um, I'm not distracted by anything because all of my attention is focused on it. So the pencil tool kind of accomplishes the same thing there. Um, so yeah, here's, here's some personal work. This is mm -hmm. wash. I did this for IMC last year. Um, and I, I bumped the colors a little bit, but honestly not by that much. Uh, and it, it is really just like that, that brutally hard edge of gouache that's very appealing to me here. And it, it's kind of nerve wracking. It's like a little bit like being in a fight for anybody that's been in a fight where it's like at any moment, like little missteps can completely screw you. Uh, whereas it, this is the reason that oil painting has never really appealed to me. I, I learned like a purist oil painter because it's very useful in terms of ha learning how to academically depict things well, because you can always kind of, it's very forgiving. Oil paint lets you wipe off and, and repaint very easily. Um, but it does not appeal to me for that exact reason. Like you can always make something look more realistic. Even the people that paint hyper real trompe l'oeil stuff like they could go back in and keep working on it there is no theoretical maximum for how accurately you can depict something until you're literally like making the thing in front of you that your painting was supposed to be <laughs> so it's it's like if you could take a piece and blow it up to the size of a building and you'd always be able to to go smaller because the size of things that we can depict doesn't approach reality so any painting that you make is going to be an abstraction and the only knob that you're turning is the degree to which you're abstracting that. Hey, uh, Alejandro has a question. What is the origin of the avatar you use, the white shirt human with the- Oh, this guy? Yeah. Uh, a dream I had like 12 years ago, maybe longer. Um, it was, so this character is, it's not really a character. Um, the way that I like to think of them, it, as well as the, the red-coated woman here and the other character. Um, these are people that I have met or been in dreams at, at different points in time. Um, they tend to be kind of archetypal. Um, so the fuzzy black head represents um, the mask that you wear to walk around things that are terrifying without being accosted because they think you're one of them. So that, that's where that came from. Um, there's a lot of stories that I want to tell with, with him. And it, it's weird, weird that I haven't seen anything that looks like this before, um, which is, it, it's, it speaks to me. It's simple and memorable. Um, it's interesting in a way that I don't think a lot of people are doing. Um, I've, I've, here's a principle that I've heard from people. When you're looking for your style, uh, don't try to be the first person to do something. Try to be the only person doing a thing. Um, it's not about being original. It's about being unique in your context. And so there's probably stuff that resembles this in various works, but nobody's doing it right now. Like, did you ever do like a comic with that fuzzy Whoever is speaking, I can barely hear you. Can you hear me? I think that's me, sir. Oh yeah, I just, yeah. I can, I have to put your mic closer to you. These are a combination of Kitbash and Photoshop. Um, some of them used as characters, or maybe all of them do, I don't remember. But a lot of the tech was hand-drawn. Like it was only important to me to get enough of the information in there before moving forward. 
Oh, Misa asks, will you do a comic with that fuzzy black character? <laughs> maybe, maybe. The, it's interesting. I, I think a lot about the life cycle of media. Um, comics are, comics move into movie form quite easily, but find it very difficult to move to book form. But a book finds it easier to move both into comics and into movies. You start with a book uh, and things translate into other media quickly. Uh, and easily, where it, it, like it's easy, easier to adapt pure writing than it is to adapt pure anything else, unless people do like world guides, like um, uh, Dan Levisi's Last Man Standing, for instance. Um, so when you start to combine the disciplines like you do in comics, it does kind of limit who your potential audience might be moving outwards. Um, so yeah, maybe one day, I'm not sure. So yeah, this is this is all me like figuring out techniques and uh, new ways of doing things. Um, this is combinations of photo bashing and painting. Uh, this is me teaching myself about way, uh, how to paint water and like making digital brush strokes. Uh, I, I have long been pursuing um, a thing that I, I've been I've been looking for this for a while, and I haven't come across anything quite satisfactory yet. Something that looks chaotic and energetic and is clearly digital um, but is elevated because it is digital not in spite of its digital media so something that actually like accentuates the strengths of of that um, I don't think it's quite there here uh, this kind of evolved into me finding uh, ways of making digital painting that resembled oil painting um, and I actually spent a, a large portion of time on this. Um, I, I made a Gumroad, but I, the technique has advanced since then, so I might make a sequel at some point. Um, if you give me a sec, I can pull up what I think is probably the best example of um, uh, replicating the appearance of digital uh, of oils in Photoshop, um, which was done after the Gumroad, so not quite contained in there. Um, but I'm pretty proud of it. And once I got there, I was like, oh, okay, I don't need to do this anymore. Because <laughs> uh, it, it doesn't feel like oil painting to make it. Also, you guys are going to gasp when you see how many uh, tabs I have. I have way too many tabs open all the time. Actually, you know what? I'm going to hide my secret shame by opening a new window. Yeah, so this is, this is Photoshop 100%. Cool. And there are ways to get all of your tools to do all of these things. Um, but the end result, honestly, is not worth, <laughs> it's just not worth it. Um, it's a very specific look. And if you were going to go for this specific look, you might as well just oil paint. That's what I ended up figuring out at the end. Hmm. Looks cool though. So this is, uh, this is Illustration also is an example of one that I started twice and finished once and then had to restart. Um, the people that have taken my class will have seen these before. But I, I basically started here and was going through this whole illustration. Um, and my idea was to have like colors coming down. And this is kind of, you can see how I'm working with that same digital appearance of oils back there, uh, trying to find that energy. And this is fine. Uh, I kind of moved forward with it and then got to here. And this was basically done. And it just didn't have the explosive energy I wanted. And it wasn't being symbolic in the ways that I wanted. I was like, well, screw it. Let's start over. <laughs> and again, some of that same kind of technique making. Uh, this, this is from the Gumroad. Uh, this is how I like to work best now, where it's, um, th this technique has become popular recently. Uh, I believe I was one of the first people doing it. I reverse engineered it from a Craig Mullins painting, and then I showed Eitan Zana, and then Eitan Zana started doing it, and then all of the Naughty Dog guys are doing it, and now you see it all over our station. But basically, uh, it's creating visual noise that you extrapolate using Mixer Brush. It's very fun. It's super loose, super gestural. I was wondering, uh, someone asked if you can demo that either now or later at the end. I can. 
this is the end of my PDF. So yeah, okay. I can spend a little bit of time getting into that. Let's see. Uh, I actually just recently did art for one of my D&D characters um, using that exact method. So let me just pop that open and I can show you what that looks like. The, the trick to it is that you, you can't let the medium dictate what it's doing. Um, because a lot of people will try this and just let themselves get pushed around by the method. Where did you go? So this is the art of the D&D character that I was talking about. And this is significantly advanced from the last time I was doing the technique also. Oh, what's happening right now? There we go. Um, oh, this is the small version. Hold on. There we go. So uh, yeah, I've used a bunch of Photoshop tricks that I didn't know back then to, to achieve the kinds of saturation that I'm looking for here. Up close, it looked like this. Really all over the place. And this is, uh, again, because this is just for me, I did approach this more like a purist. You can see like all of the marks that have been made in here. But this is another example of one where I basically finished the thing before I uh, realized what I actually wanted out of it. Um, let me see if I can pull up an earlier version because it's very different. I, I was originally painting this um, sort of how I would have painted a piece of uh, character art. Come on, open up. Yeah, so I did this first where I, I basically just painted the whole thing um, with a hard round brush. And then I realized that it, it just wasn't speaking to me the way that, that I wanted it to. Um, so I went in and did, mm, do I have this here? I don't have it in this file. So basically the method is this. Um, I'm gonna take the whole thing, paste it up, add some noise, Come on. I don't know why it's not letting me do this. Come on. It looks like it might just lag a little. Photoshop, the new Photoshop does that sometimes. Yeah, I'm not using the newest Photoshop. Oh, okay. But because that, that's what happened. There we go. I don't know why that is. That's just a huge image. <laughs> it is a, a very large image. That is very true. I think it's like 9K tall. Um, here, I'll, I'll paste it into a new document so that I. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty big. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck is happening here. Okay. It shouldn't be doing this. I have not had this problem in a while. Do I need to reboot? There we go. Okay, weird. Let me just close down that one. Don't need that. Um, so the problem with using this just as is is that the noise is um, constant. Um, what I want is for stuff to have disrupted edges. Uh, so then I will actually run the camera raw filter noise because you'll see what it does differently from the regular noise filter which just kind of applies a noise texture on top of everything the camera raw filter grain will actually distort the edges so looking at there so you can see the grain here actually can modulate what's happening there so if i um I don't know if there's a way to turn the flick preview on and off from the camera rock filter, but I can just. So you can see how it's actually changed where the edges of things are. I want something like that. And I also want it to be fuzzy because I'm going to sharpen it up. Also, from this distance, no, it, like there's virtually no difference. But um, what that will do, you know what? I actually do want more grain. Let's, let's add more actual grain. There. Okay, cool. Again, from back here, more or less the same. But now, uh, normally when you use the mixer brush, you're sampling from an area. And um, actually, can I just paste this in? Yeah. So if if I were to use, uh, 
think about how I was demoing this super well. Let me just pull it. So let's just say I'm sampling from a smooth passage. If I'm using the mixer brush, normally I'm going to get stuff like this, which is pretty good. Um, that'll do a lot of what I want. But to get the real textural brush stroke feel, what I think I need is variation in that brush stroke. So if I sample from this, now it has all of this streakiness in it that I like. Um, so now the way that I approach it is I look for passages that need to have softer or slower transitions. So like maybe right here, um, that area is pretty abrupt. I could widen that transition by sampling small and painting big. See how that kind of like uh, distorts that transition and softens it out a little bit while keeping the brush stroke pretty chunky. That's essentially what I'm doing. There, there's a bunch of stuff in it. Um, sample small, paint big. I'm looking for, this is one of those areas where I'll, I'll look for that kind of controlled chaos, um, where I'll deliberately seek out kind of happy accidents. And I'm always willing to kind of go back and, and forward with it. Um, yeah. I'll like tighten that up there, or I can go across it. But yeah, this is one of the ways I like to work for myself. Mixer brush is super powerful. I could probably do a whole class on just that. Okay. Yeah, that looks great. Yeah. I, hope, I hope that kind of explains the base use case of it. It's, uh, let's see, maybe there's another thing that I can do real quick. Let me just paint something really fast. Um, so like if I were to just draw a face, say, We're going over time, but I'm, I don't have anywhere to be. Yeah, we usually go over like 15 minutes because there's sure. like some people ask questions. Like you have a couple questions that's pretty long too, so. Yeah, if, if people have questions, you can ask me. I can uh, talk while I work. Okay, so here's one by uh, Hua Ming, I think. Uh, there are so many techniques that can be used in concept art, 3D, kit bash, sculpting, photo bash, et cetera. Uh, as someone who wants to be a concept artist, it often feels overwhelming trying to learn all of that. And I guess uh, he's asking, he's saying he's always learning, but like, you know, he feels like if he splits between learning all those, he's not improving fast enough. So like, what should he be working on to make things portfolio worthy? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. It's something that I've talked to people uh, at length about. I, I actually went through my own kind of creative crisis, Josh, you might remember this, where I was like debating whether or not to get into photo bashing for the first time. Um, and uh, the, there were there were two things that helped me in the end. One, um, a couple of very good friends reminded me that just because you start going down one path doesn't mean you lose your skills in another. It's more important that you make a choice and live with it than that you make a very specific choice and that that choice is the correct one. Um, you gotta pick a direction and this falls in with the exact philosophy that I was talking about before. You have to have a plan to change a plan. You can't change your mind until you've made it up at least once. So when you are thinking about like, what should you learn in order to get good at concept art and have a portfolio ready piece? Well, it doesn't really matter because there's so much to learn. You just go in a direction until you realize that it's not serving you anymore, but you have to start going in a direction. And I realize that that doesn't necessarily help a lot, but the thing that I would say to watch out for is don't just keep going down a direction because that's the direction you've already been going down. It, I mean, art is fun. It's cool. Uh, it's one of the coolest things that you can do for a living. And following things that catch your interest, even if they're just momentarily exciting, is a really cool thing that you can do. Um, all of your drawing skills will be waiting for you there to pick back up when you come back to them. 
even if you're a little bit rusty, they, they come back real fast. So that's one thing. The other thing is photo bashing in 3D really are that side of the equation that I talked about in terms of executing like a cheater. Um, there's not a lot of technical ability that goes into them um, that doesn't go into like painting or anything like that. Like th there are some phenomenally skilled like VFX artists and uh, 3D artists, but if all you're trying to get to is something that looks finished, like learning like a purist to be able to depict will also allow you to edit easier later. So I say fundamentals of light and color and composition and stuff like that. Learning how to do it like a painter makes it easier to go in the direction of bashing than the other way around. Um, at a certain point, you make the decision to actively start learning those things, though. Does that answer the question? Oh, sorry, there was a second part to that. Sorry. The other part was, uh, I was I was having a bit of, um, I was having a bit of uh, personal uh, trouble. Like, I, I was feeling really depressed about not being able to make the decision. I was like, man, there are so many people around me who are incredible painters. Um, and uh, I went to the Safe House Atelier before it closed down. Um, I, I happened to go to school with some very, very skilled people that have all become very big names. And um, I was on Carla Ortiz's rooftop at a New Year's party, uh, talking to her and Jeremy Mann about this exact problem. And I was like, yeah, man, I, I, I'm feeling a little tired of the painting. Uh, I feel like it's not necessarily improving me as best as I want, but like also, you know, I, I enjoy the look of it. I enjoy the process of the drawing and, and all that stuff. Like, how do I know what to do? And uh, they were like, yeah, you just got to feel it out for yourself, figure out what you want. It's, it's like, there's so many cool things out there. How do you decide on what those things are? Um, so the question that I ultimately ended up asking that ended up being the most useful to me was I asked Carla, because she had been gung-ho about being a purist painter, I asked her if it was difficult to decide to do that. Um, I, I wanted to know, because she made it look so easy to make that decision, like, if that had even been ever a question in her head that she would turn out that way. And uh, I was very surprised to find out that she said that um, it was a very difficult decision that she continually felt challenged by, even being this deep into drawing and painting now and at this point in her career. Um, and I found that to be the case with people that I've checked in with about the same topic later, that when people are confronted by that thing, it is a hard decision. Most of the time, people will find it difficult to make that decision and it should be difficult. Um, but that means that you're getting an impression of the different kinds of art that you like for different reasons. And, and you're learning about things that you can make informed decisions about. And that's really cool. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be a hard decision to make, but let it be hard. Uh, let it be a difficult decision and let it hurt when you choose a thing to follow that eliminates something else from your, your path for a little bit but be willing to go back when it doesn't feel right for you anymore. I hope that helps. Uh, yeah, so does anyone else have uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Like, uh, you use a lot of tools in your work. You do. The most like natural way to to learn these tools is it like um picking up a tutorial and trying it out or uh, coming up with a project in which you want to use like a, some tools like um how how to build up the build up this uh like uh to, tool back for yourself uh it depends right like most of the time so I, I'm familiar enough with the programs now that I have an idea in my head of what I think they should be able to do. And so normally breaking the process down into steps like that, um, there's somebody on the internet that has had a similar thought for a different purpose. Um, and so yeah, there's gonna be a lot of internet tutorials that teach you the different parts of a process and being able to construct that process for yourself out of those different pieces means that you can just pick up the skills from whatever tutorials you find. Um, 
other parts are like, I come across a tool in Photoshop and I'm like, oh, I didn't know that was there. And, oh, that's weird. And then I start m messing around with it. And I'm like, okay, what kind of effects does this produce? And how do I incorporate those into my workflow? And then I just mess around with it for a little bit. Um, I wish there were more to it than that, but it, it really isn't. It is just me saying, oh, that's kind of cool. And then thinking, okay, how do I use that? Like for instance, the blur gallery, like I could use the blur gallery here to get some, some noise into this. Uh, let's just take a quick look. If people are not familiar with the blur gallery, it's pretty cool. Basically, it lets you have a blur applied along a shape. So you see from the center toward the outside, it blurs more. And that's one of the things that was brought up in a newer version of Photoshop that I'm vaguely aware exists. And so now I have incorporated it as one of the tools that I can use because when it came out, I got excited about it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it, it's about following, you know, the curiosity that's present already in how you approach things. Like people become artists because they have good taste and they want to find ways to depict things. They think things are cool. And um, I think in a lot of ways when people are learning, uh, you, you learn not to do things just because they're cool, because you're, you're training your tastes. And that is a necessary part of developing as an artist. But um, then you have to relearn how to enjoy it uh, because you've spent so long with your head down. And that's fine, that's a part of the process. It's not something to beat yourself up over, um, but it is a necessary action to take later to, to really get back into why do you do art and how does that drive the decisions that you're making? Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, so uh, this is basically what I've been doing here is just putting together something so that I can paint that method that we were talking about before. Um, so once I'm roughly here-ish, just hit the core shadow here. Well, that's much more beautiful than I was expecting it to be. I'm going to keep that. <laughs> I thought I was oh, looking really good. Like, <laughs> I was not expecting to like that as much as I do. Yeah. Um, okay. Hey, so Lee, I'll you're in Travis. What? I got a question for you. Uh, you're uh, kind of a little bit about your story in your early days, like you're you're breaking into the industry, your pitfalls, troubles. It, it, was it smooth for you? Was it tough? Uh, always curious to know kind of how an artist like yourself kind of went down that road. Uh, you mean like how I got my first job? Yeah, like industry. Yeah, like breaking in and, and whatnot. Yeah. So. Uh, Again, I, I did have the benefit of going to a very good school. Um, I think the Safe House Atelier has something like a, it, it, if people are familiar with art school, they know that like the, the success rate uh, of people who graduate to having careers is very, very, very low. Um, it's, it tends to be like somewhere between like three and 4%. At very good schools that can jump to like 15 to 30, uh, I believe my class at the Safe House Atelier had somewhere like 95% employment within six months of graduating. Um, and all of the people there have become, you know, very skilled painters and industry professionals with lots of connections. And so I had access um, to, uh, to some really good people, basically, um, that we were all invested in each other's careers and watching each other's backs. Um, I do think it's really important to foster that kind of um, network because art is a social thing. Art is also its context. And so when I started looking for work, um, the first job I got ever uh, outside of school, I did like random school projects here and there, was actually through John Shindahedi's art order back in the day because I was talking to other students on the art order and I ran into John and they recommended me to him for use on D&D. &D. And so D&D &D was actually my first freelance gig. And then a few years later, I'd been applying to places. Uh, I'd been doing some work for Volta uh, for a while and uh, they, they said that they were gonna bring me up there. Um, 
to work full time on site. Uh, but it just kept not happening. And I, I got impatient um, and started looking for other work down in the States. Um, and I ended up applying to and getting an interview with Fifth Cell back in the day. And I went through um, a couple of rounds of interviews and an art test. Um, and they flew me out and they made me a soft offer. And then like two weeks before my start date, they rescinded their soft offer, which was a dick move, but they're dead now and I'm not, so that's good. Um, yeah. uh, but what that meant was I had let all of my freelance clients kind of like dry up. I, I hadn't been planning for the future because I thought I had a start date. This is a big lesson, by the way. I consider it to be true that you do not have the job until you have already received your first paycheck. Until you have received your first paycheck, you actually don't have the job, even if they've full-time employed you and put you through a bunch of paperwork. So. Good advice. Yeah, there, <laughs> it's, it's useful not to, it, it's sort of like the don't count your chickens right. before they're hatched, but also because those chickens are gonna be dicks. <laughs> uh, Yori has a question. Uh, any resource curriculums you would suggest for learning the fundamental classic approach like the one they had at the Safe House Atelier? So there are Atelier programs everywhere. Uh, I think the Safe House Ateliers was particularly good. Um, the Safe House Atelier itself is now defunct, but Carl Dobsky, who was the guy that ran it, now has his own education program down in LA. Uh, I do not know what it's called, and I haven't been in touch with him recently. He's done a set of online workshops that have been very good. Um, there are a few people that are teaching at the Workshop Academy that are very skilled at this, like uh, Paul and Lena Richards. And who, who, who's your figure drawing teacher again, Josh? Uh, Naomi's very good. and some uh, Abigail person. Platter? Yeah, yeah, Abigail Platter. She's really good. She has the training yeah. from uh, Watts Atelier. Yeah, see, so Watts Atelier. There, there's Atelier programs in most states at this point. They've been getting more and more popular. They're also way 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 cheaper than traditional art schools like an atelier program so okay the tuition at art center i believe right now is hovering at around like 48 grand a year or something <laughs> right isn't it like something yeah, absurdly it's ridiculous yeah yeah so just for context people the tuition for the tuition rent food and all of my supplies for two years of my atelier program was like 20 grand like the, the difference is absurd. Um, Damn. Better in a lot of ways. And, yeah. and you can find them around. The, if you're trying to self teach, I actually think that the guy who does the draw box stuff is, is really good. Um, I also have worked up my own methodologies for teaching some people that have asked me for quick and easy exercises to teach themselves fundamentals. It's not going to be nearly as technical as that, but it's like meant for beginners uh, and consistent exercise. Um, which I would be happy to share outside of this. I've, I've already talked to some people about my shipbook method um, of, of learning. There are other ones. The, the important thing is just to know what to focus on and be talking to the right people who can help evaluate your work. Um, because like, even if you're going through a crap program, if you're talking to uh, industry professionals that know how to tell you whether or not the study that you're doing is working or what you should be focusing on next, then you're gonna be fine. Yeah, I agree with that. Like, I feel like our industry, people are usually pretty open to just like answering yeah. emails, giving tips, you know. People that don't share their techniques are dicks. Because like, you're never going to stay ahead of the curve on either technical skill or stylistic approach. If it's cool, other people will start doing it. And they will work out how to do it. And somebody is going to work out how to do it better than you do. Um, like, if you look at Ruan Gia's, skill set well there's a bunch of painters out there that can paint like ruan gia now because ruan gia made a school and yeah, he's teaching a bunch like of 300 students per yeah. term so good fucking luck painting like that uh but also like that knowledge is out there and people have figured out how to do it okay so i think uh we can maybe take one last question before we end this sure. and if there's no question we can just end it okay someone's asking if you do paid mentorships I do not currently do paid mentorships. Uh, I doubt that I will be able to offer them in the future because of my work at Wizards. Uh, I might be able to do unpaid mentorships, but the time investment that I would be able to commit to that would be very low at the moment. Um, 
it is, it is a thing that I would be interested in offering. I don't have any plans to offer one in the near future. Cool. Uh, yeah, well, thanks for the talk. I mean, you know, yeah, absolutely. So. Just by the way, I've been doing this painting for a bit now. Has it kind of explained that working method to people just watching me do it? Yeah, that looks really cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks everyone for uh, joining. Yeah, thanks all. Yeah. We'll try thanks to do more. Lot, ways, you know, so. Yeah. Have a good Sunday, everybody. Yep. Thanks. Take care. All right. Later.